So today we are going to talk about the number one mistake that SLPs make in treating childhood apraxia of speech. This is such an important mistake, which is going to determine whether or not you're going to have may or very minimal outcomes or incredible outcomes that are real game changers, not only for the child's short term, but long term. This topic is so important. If you work with children with childhood apraxia of speech, make sure to catch this episode. So first, let's talk about the treatment target that is often selected for children with childhood apraxia of speech. The problem with this treatment target is the treatment target that is typically selected for children with childhood apraxia of speech is that it is way too simple. So we talk about this on every single episode, but the lower your treatment target, the lower the gains period. Whether you're working in the area of speech, language, literacy, attention, play skills, motor skills, Less is less, more is more. When we're working with preschoolers, when neuroplasticity is at its greatest level, we want to create lifelong change. That's only possible if we aim high. So if you're with me, and if you want to create change, and if you want the next hundred years of this child's life to be dramatically different, you can do that as a speech language pathologist, but it's not gonna happen if you're going to select low treatment targets. That is a race to the bottom. If you want to create change, you're going to have to run to the top when neuroplasticity is at the highest level. And that's going to be accomplished through selecting the most complex, challenging treatment target possible with all of the tools that you can provide to help the child and provide support. So when we get to this number one, very important mistake, the most important mistake that speech pathologists make in treating childhood apraxia of speech, that is selecting way too simple of a treatment target. So what is often happening in treating childhood apraxia of speech is that speech language pathologists are getting very far away from what speech is. And what is speech? Speech is a continuous motor activity. It's a continuous motor activity. It's called an open loop activity. It's automatic and it's fast and it's continuous. It's like swinging a golf club or it's like, like swinging a baseball bat. It's a continuous movement. So if we take that continuous motor, complex motor action of speech and we teach it in this very discreet manner of teaching a sound in isolation, or a syllable in isolation. That is the equivalent of trying to teach someone a tennis or a golf swing or a, bat or, a, or a baseball swing and saying, let's just swing it an inch at a time. And we're gonna practice an inch at a time and you're gonna get better at a baseball swing or you're gonna get better at a golf swing. Or if you're like me and you love tennis, at a tennis swing, by doing one inch at a time and practicing one inch at a time. And at the end, you'll get better at the sport. Well, well, speech is like that. It's a continuous, automatic, open loop activity, and it needs to be taught in a continuous, automatic, motor activity manner. And if you're not doing that, you're very far from speech. So it's going to take a very long time for you to make gains. So we know this when we look at research in other areas as well. The further away the activity you do in speech is like your goal, 
the longer it's going to take to achieve that goal. You are so far away from communication. If you are working on a sound in isolation, or if you're working on a sound at the syllable level, that is called a closed loop motor activity. That is, an, that is a purposeful, discrete task. That is not speech. And so many speech pathologists are doing that. So I'll give you an example. If we have the word banana, a speech pathologist will start with the, with the sound ah uh, in isolation, the vowel ah. Uh, and then they'll go up to a CV combination, na. And then they'll go up to a CV, CV combination, na, na. And then they're gonna go up to a CV, 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 na, na, na. And then they're gonna go up to a CV, 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 banana. They're taking a chisel to the rock. You're taking a chisel to the rock and you're going to go very, very, very slowly and make progress at a very, very slow rate. And the price in doing so is great. And why is the price in doing so so great? Because neuroplasticity is at its highest level at the preschool level. And we can't waste time. If you are a speech language pathologist working in the schools, like myself, you have 30 to 60 minutes a week. You cannot waste time by getting a chisel out and starting at the single sound level, syllable level, bisyllabic level, polysyllabic level, and, and going for perhaps uh, 80 to 90% mastery before proceeding to the next level with your chisel. Tick tock. So, we need to move away from A, what is far away from speech, which is teaching discrete bits of sound. Not only is the motor act in itself so unlike speech and that it's purposeful and discrete, another thing to consider is that the brain doesn't process individual sounds as it does language. That goes into, some research suggests, a non-linguistic area of the brain, an area of the brain that processes a doorbell sound or a knock. It's not linguistic. So the further we are away from communication, the further you are away from gains, the further you are from creating change in the brain. If you are working on simple, you're creating simple neuronal connections. If you are working on complex, you are creating complex neuronal connections. And that's when the brain is at its greatest level of plasticity. This is when you can change the next 100 years of this child's life. The stakes are very, very high. The treatment target matters a lot. I liken the treatment target to food, okay? It, if you wanna be healthy, food is perhaps about 80% of your outcome when it comes to your body and how your body functions. When it comes to your brain, the treatment target, and this is what my research is finding, is extremely important to the outcome and how your brain is going to function. Once again, I'm going to repeat this again. If you're going for a low level treatment target, it's a race to the bottom. If you're going for a higher level treatment target, it's a race to the top. It really matters a lot. So you could be doing everything right in your practice. You could be doing every effective strategy when it comes to treating childhood apraxia of speech. And we'll, we'll discuss those another day. This is a quick episode. But if you're putting garbage in, you're going to get garbage out results. And the garbage in is the simple non-speech treatment targets. Okay, so it's kind of like if you're going to the gym and you're working out and you're doing all the great things with the world's best personal trainer and the best plan possible, and you're stopping off at McDonald's. And you're intaking 
like the treatment ticket, you're intaking garbage. You're not going to make gains. Your treatment targets matter as much as your food do when it comes to change. It's very important. The more nutritious the food, the better you're going to operate. The more complex the treatment target, the better the gains in the brain and the cascading effects in which the gains are going to have a waterfall effect. And instead of taking that chisel to the rock and going one step at a time at a very slow pace, you're going to take, as Lynn Williams would say, fireworks to that rock. Take those fireworks to that rock and do a more complex treatment target early on and naturally get those segments and those sounds developing naturally. So aim high. Okay, so what do I mean by aim high? I mean, I want you to aim for the clusters. Go for the clusters. They're so much more powerful than the singleton sounds. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Kelly, this child can't even produce simple vowels. And you don't, you want to go up from the stops and the fricatives and the affricates, and you want to go right into the clusters, Kelly. What, how is that possible? We have to stop caring about what the child can do on their own. We need to care about what the child could do. What could the child do when you give dynamic, tactile, temporal cueing? When you give 100% auditory cueing and choral slowed speech, when you're giving the visual cues, the touch cues, every cue in your toolbox to produce those clusters, then you're creating change. That is a starting point. When it comes to creating goals for a child, I could care less what they do on their own. I'm an agent of change. You're an agent of change. We're not here to do status quo. We're here to change lives. If we want to change lives, we're going to do that by emptying out our toolbox and creating intelligently scaffolding and supporting the child so the child can perform at the highest level possible. You need to be, or we need to be a visionary. You need to believe in the child and you need to believe in your ability to help that child. I always go to the Eiffel Tower and Gustav Eiffel because Gustav Eiffel, no one believed in him at his time. No one believed in him during this time period, but he believed in himself and he believed in his work and he had a vision that was higher than those around him. That's how we're gonna create change. We're not gonna create change by doing status quo. And by, by looking at where the child is and going one small step at or above that level. We're going to do that by emptying out our toolbox and trying everything in that toolbox to see what works with an individual child and going as high as we can go. And when we go really, really high, do you know what happens with these children with childhood apraxia of speech? The simpler sounds will spontaneously develop. So we talked about today the number one mistakes SLPs make in treating children with childhood apraxia of speech. And it's a game changer. It's a life changer. And what we can do instead which is to aim as high as possible and go for those clusters, just like you would with any other child and give that child with childhood apraxia of speech a time. Go slowly, really slowly. Be choral speech, 
speak in unison at a slow pace with this child that allows the child not only time to perceive the sound, but also time to produce it with you. Three, another thing we're going to do is use touch prompt. And don't touch the child. Have the child touch themselves. But to help them with proprioception and knowing where their mouth and their structures and where they're functioning in space. Three, use space. Move your hands in space and show them how these sounds are produced in the mouth using large gross and fine motor movements with your body. It's very connected and it's very important. And lastly, use sound and music and melody. Use rhythm and sounds and move the body with the mouth. And what happens when you're moving your fine motor, your fingertips, your limbs is with the mouth at the same time is you're lighting the cerebellum up like a light bulb. You're lighting the area of the tongue and the vocal fold movement up when you're using your fine motor and gross motor movement simultaneously which means that vocalization can come for them more easily through the stimulation of that area of the cerebellum, the anterior, which is the front part of the cerebellum, being lit up by a light bulb. So what we're going to do at the end of the day is we're not doing status quo. We're not moving away from speech. And we're not looking at the child and where the child is as a starting point. Instead, we're going to be visionaries and we're going to aim high and we're going to think not can the child do this. We're going to ask how can the child do this and then we're going to empty out that toolbox every tool you have available to yourself and you're going to believe in yourself and you're going to believe in the child and you're going to aim high and when you do you're going to change lives. So that was today's session. It's time to take all of this information. It's time to roll up your sleeves. And it's time to change some lives, one child at a time. If you're looking for the specific step by steps on in the videos from the book, on like, how do you do this, Kelly? It sounds really, really nice. Not only do I write it in a simple step-by-step -step in my book, I also have the video clips to show what it looks like. And then on top of that, which is the most important part, is I have a form for you to fill in in a step-by-step -step manner in which I want you to create better. I don't want you to do what I do. I know that you bring to the table this unique, brilliant skill set that I don't have. And I know that you're going to take what all of our graduate students do, which is amazing work, what I do, which is great too, and you're gonna make it a million times better.